Well, hello everybody. Uh, wow, so good to be here at the OpenShift Commons in San Francisco. And thanks for the really amazing talk so far. It's always interesting to hear other people's views on the technologies you're using yourself. So thanks a lot. Uh, next, we are going to talk about OpenShift. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> to be more precise, we're going to talk about the software engineering model that's in use at ELISA and how OpenShift enables us to implement it in practice. Uh, first, shortly about ourselves. My name is Severi Haverla, the guy on the left. And the fine gentleman next to me are Niklas Tanskanen. Hi. And Jesse Haka. And all of us three, we work at the DevOps team in ELISA. What we do, uh, among other duties, our task is to keep OpenShift up and running, but also support the development teams so that they have a kind of a pleasant journey with putting their applications running in containers and open shifts. Uh, I guess there might be some people among you who are not from Finland, yes? <laughs> so I guess it's a good time to introduce Elisa to, to you. So yes, sir. Okay, so what is Elisa? Elisa is a telecommunications, ICT and digital service company and a market leader in Finland. And uh, during our 135 year history, we have always been enthusiastic about uh, utilizing new te technologies and ways of working. Uh, we now serve over 2.8 million customers in Finland, Estonia and uh, internationally. And uh, back in the days, we were just a typical telecommunications company, but uh, nowadays we are much more than that. We are working in business unit covered software services, which is mainly focusing on uh, digital services. And uh, one of our biggest services is called Elisa Vihde, which is kind of an entertainment system there you can rent movies and uh, watch live TV channels. All right. And then just a few words about Deficode and uh, more importantly about the collaboration between Elisa and Deficode. So, Severi and I work at the EFICode. Uh, EFICode is a leading DevOps uh, house in the Nordics. Uh, we have almost 200 professionals uh, in the Nordics, Nordic countries. Uh, and what we do is that we enable organizations to reach the fullest potential in today's digital world. And with Elisa already being a leading telco and a forerunner in uh, digital services, it has been truly been a uh, uh, joint effort uh, doing these uh, great services together. And uh, we work together uh, in uh, areas like DevOps or design and UX. And uh, we have done so for an almost uh, a decade. And uh, we also organize multiple cutting edge events together, such as the DevOps 2017, which was held last year in Helsinki or the design system conference, which was late, organized just lately also in Helsinki. And what we aim to do as organization is, is to learn from each other and uh, do and build great stuff together. But enough about that. Uh, let's move on to the topic of the day, uh, which uh, it's going to start by introducing the software engineering model at ELISA. Uh, which is a model that describes how software production and software development should be done at ELISA. And it comes around the three points. Uh, first of all, we need a platform. We need a platform that can run those services and the development of those services. And we need that platform to be fast, uh, efficient, and flexible. Uh, so I guess you could say that it needs to be software-driven. So let's call it uh, software-driven cloud. And when we have that platform, uh, we want that the development uh, of those services uh, should be uh, done on that platform and it should be easy uh, and automated. And uh, when it's easy and automated, uh, that leads to faster learning, uh, uh, faster development with smaller iterations, meaning faster time to production uh, and uh, less errors and uh, 
more importantly, it enables the developers to feel that the, uh, they are getting stuff done, because that's very important when you're developing something, that you can actually get stuff done. And finally, uh, we want to shift the end user experience uh, to the teams themselves, meaning that the product in production should produce meaningful metrics to the development team so they can get, take action and uh, develop the uh, product in the way that the business sees it. And uh, another other, other thing is that the uh, development team should have easy access to production, meaning that the pipeline from the Git commit uh, to the production is fully automated and every developer has access to it. And uh, next, ESA is going to tell you more about the software-driven cloud history. <coughs> okay. So, 2016, uh, we started to contribute to Kubernetes, and uh, we are doing also that nowadays. But uh, uh, so we, we have we had uh, separate Kubernetes clusters for e every team, but uh, we, we saw that it didn't work quite well because we didn't have enough Kubernetes people in house. So we started working something else, and. Uh, we decided to use OpenSit for everybody. 2017, we had a one OpenSit cluster for everybody, but soon, soon we saw again that uh, it is not maybe the perfect solution. We, have, we had a problems with stability of that cluster. And when we had only one cluster, it was quite, uh, it was not good situation at all. So 2018, we had nowadays two production clusters and uh, two development clusters for everybody. And because we have two OpenSeed production clusters, we need some kind of way to load balance traffic between these. I have seen that someone uses here a DNS-based solution, but uh, we think that uh, it is not maybe the perfect solution because we want that we have application level failover capabilities. And we can archive that with a load balancer. So we, we have decided that uh, we have a load balancer in front of these clusters, and uh, how we are updating this load balancer. So we have an in-house made solution for that, and uh, it basically means that uh, it is installed for every cluster, and it is listening all the changes in OpenShift, and uh, then it, it is updating that load balancer configuration automatically. And uh, it, it means that, uh, for instance, if you want to create new application for D DC1 cluster, you can do that. And uh, then the load balancer will just make the traffic for DC1 cluster. And uh, th this our solution is available in GitHub, so if you are interested, you can take a look how it is made and how it works. And our next target I is to get uh, more projects to production. <coughs> All right, so how do we get those projects into production? Well, as we see it, we have to get the developers engaged. Well, how do we get that done? So it's actually really simple. We just use the force. We, we burn all the silly VMs to the ground and just force them to use the containers and put them running on OpenShift. Let's, let's have a quick life. That easy. Yeah. Let's have a quick live demo of this. So everybody in the audience, please stand up. Yeah, that's what I thought. You can sit down if you, <laughs> if you did it. So forcing people to do uncomfortable things, it doesn't really work out that well. Uh, so that wasn't the way to go. Uh, what we actually did is that we took a pilot project. So enter Elisa Vihde. So as you've heard, it's an entertainment service. You can watch live TV, rent movies, and stuff like that. And so back in spring 2017, Elisa Vihde was starting a new project. They were having like a full renovation on their video rental service. And we thought that that's the perfect opportunity to us to kind of implement the software engineering model in practice and, and also use OpenShift to do it. So what we did is that we sat down with the development teams just to see how they were producing software at that point. And we saw that they were using Jenkins as their primary CI, CD solution. And how they were deploying into production, they had 
these VMs that they were, uh, and they were deploying the software using Ansible. And they weren't really familiar with containers or container orchestration platforms and such. And in, in general, I guess they, they were interested about, uh, about OpenShift, but also uh, quite a few people were a bit skeptical as well. So, as all of you know, developing with, with containers and, and putting the production running on top of them, it's, it's a whole different game. And for that reason, we, we wanted to start out with something that's familiar to the development team. So we took Jenkins, and we put Jenkins running on OpenShift. And we integrated the CI CD pipelines with OpenShift using the OpenShift Jenkins plugin. And bit by bit, the development teams, they got a bit more interested about the platform and, and kind of saw what it's capable of. But also, when we were doing it, the complexity grew quite fast. We wanted to add different kinds of functionalities to the pipelines and, and, and such. So in, in order to keep everything maintainable and, and also keeping the pipelines readable, we decided to create our own shared Jenkins library on top of the already existing OpenShift Jenkins plugin. Uh, next, Niklas is going to talk a bit more about the shared library. So why we created this library? Well, uh, the OpenShift did not provide support uh, for things that we wanted to do out of the box. Neither did the uh, OpenShift uh, Jenkins uh, plugin. So we uh, uh, built out a library on top of the, top of the Jenkins uh, plugin. And we introduced multiple features like uh, multiple production cluster uh, deployments, meaning that the Jenkins pipeline will deploy uh, application to both of the uh, production cluster that we have. We also had uh, canary deployments introduced into the, into the library so that the developer have, has easy access to that. Uh, integration test and uh, environment setups, uh, code analysis, and the, one of the most important features the, of the pipeline is that the, uh, it's, available, it's able to do preview environments. Uh, we deploy every branch of, uh, of, of the application directly into OpenShift and the dev environment. Going to demo that in a bit, but uh, first let's go over to the demos. And the first demo that I'm going to show you is that how easy it is for the uh, developer to get started on a new project in our environment. So here I am in one of the dev clusters. Uh, I'm logged in using single sign-on uh, with Elisa credentials. Everyone has these credentials already. Every can, everyone can log in into the cluster and create a new project. I've selected Jenkins from the catalog. This is a Red Hat provided Jenkins with some modifications, uh, and I'm deploying it here. And before the Jenkins container starts, it's going to boot up an init container in front of the Jenkins. And this init container is going to ask the developer a few questions. Uh, about the uh, plugin configurations in Jenkins so that I don't have to write any guides on how to do the configurations. The developer just simply will ignore them and not, not use this platform at all. But with using this uh, wizard here, that this cool wizard that tells what to do actually, uh, I can engage the developer easily into the development in top, top, top of OpenShift. So I have some features here like uh, GitHub single sing on. I can add admin users here, uh, organizations from the GitHub. And in the moment, the Jenkins is going to start uh, with the configurations that the developer just put in. I have also here uh, all, uh, set up uh, the Jenkins slaves, slave images, so that the uh, developer really has a fast start using OpenShift. We also integrated the uh, uh, the library that we talked about uh, into the into this Jenkins, and uh, this way he or she can just copy paste the pipeline example to the Jenkins, and right away can deploy stuff into OpenShift. And this all takes about 15 minutes. Oops. Okay, here we go. 
And the next demo is about the preview environments. Before I start the demo, uh, just gonna tell you that uh, I have a small app here that says greetings from the Spring Boot. And I want to change that application's background to red. So let's go and see how do I do that. So here's the app. Here's the pipeline that builds it in Jenkins that I set up previously. Uh, here it is in OpenShift deployed by the pipeline. And what I'm now going to do is I'm gonna check out a new branch and I'm gonna modify the code so that the background is going to be red. And uh, here we go, git commit, and then push. And now it's in GitHub, or git. And going to the Jenkins, it should have received the webhook. Yes, there it is. It received webhook from the GitHub. Please start building this branch. And what now happens is that the uh, pipeline is going to build the infrastructure that it's, re it's re is requiring uh, to the OpenShift. So here I am, it's already being deployed. And you notice that it has a hello world dash red, so that it has the app name dash branch in it. And if we go to the shared library here, uh, this is one of the template files of the library. This is a root object uh, template file. And what the pipeline does is that it substitutes these variables on the template file with the variables in the from the pipeline. And if I now get the uh, root from the uh, OpenShift, and this root here was created by the pipeline using the, this template um, as a basis. So this way the developer really doesn't even have to know about uh, OpenShift objects. And if I now fast forward the build, so, and change the URL from the master branch to the red branch, I have a red background. And I think that, um, if you were fast enough, uh, you saw that I only used the Git here. Everything else was fully automated. The OpenShift was automated. The Jenkins uh, build uh, was automated. Only, did, only thing that I did was a simple Git checkout and Git commit and Git push. And this really enables the developer to have a very fast start with OpenShift and start hacking about uh, uh, stuff. And uh, if you think about UX designer, he or she can now change the layout and uh, just do a simple git push and uh, it will end up in OpenShift and they can share the route with the product owner or business owner immediately so they don't have to set up the dev environment into the, on their own laptop. Yeah. All right, so of course, all of this, it wasn't just a walk in the park. Uh, we had some challenges as well. Uh, maybe the first one is that keeping the development teams engaged with the CI, CD practices and with OpenShift, it's, it's actually quite challenging. Uh, our initial plan was to provide really good support in the beginning and then kind of slowly allow the dev development teams to take full ownership of, of all, all their pipelines and kind of fade into the background and let, let them handle their stuff. Well, <laughs> didn't really work out that well. Quite soon we realized that we were providing too good of a support as the developers actually fully relied on us on all their CI, CD, OpenShift related needs. So lessons learned, you really have to try to find the balance on between like, supporting the teams but still like kind of allowing them to make their own mistakes and so that they actually take full ownership of their stuff. But then again, it's also really important to have like, kind of a smooth learning curve with the platform. Of course, this depends on the people. Some people are more, more interested about new things, but some people are, don't really like to change the ways they are working. So if you are already a bit skeptical about the platform and you have a bad first impression, you start blaming all the problems on the platform itself. So that's what happened a few times. OpenShift was blamed for many of the many of the bugs that were actually code related. Uh, lastly, creating Jenkins shared libraries, it's not always that fun actually. Uh, it's sometimes really hard to test them, the development is quite slow and stuff like that. But these are things you can actually live with and, and, and kind of mitigate as well. So, next to the fun stuff. Yeah, uh, well, 
during our time with OpenShift so far has proven that it can handle the workloads as that we throw at it. And uh, maybe a little too good if the, one day the Elisa Vih, the project lead, came to, came to us and is it really so that when the pipeline finishes, the stuff is in production? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> and they deployed accidentally to the production already. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we are eager to see how the platform evolves even further. Okay. Thanks, everybody. And